If you can now open your, the front of your bulletin to commandments number 10 and 9. Pastor Kim and I are doing two commandments a night. And uh, we'll read this together. I'll announce the commandment. You read the bold part, and then I will say, in place of Martin Luther, what does this mean? And then we'll read that together. Commandment number 10, together. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, male or female servant, livestock, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we do not entice, force, or steal away from our neighbors, their spouses, household workers, or livestock, but instead urge them to stay and fulfill their responsibilities to our neighbors. Commandment number nine. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we do not try to trick our neighbors out of their inheritance or property or try to get it for ourselves by claiming to have a legal right to it and the like, but instead be of help and service to them in keeping what is theirs. Now you may have noticed that I got louder on the what does this mean and on that but instead because, as I know many of you know, Martin Luther in this glorious move of his and with all his honesty about his sins and his discovery of grace, he saw that the commandments were not just thou shalt nots, but, and he may have been the first, others followed him, he said there is a plus side to the commandments. Faith is not a bunch of do nots. It's a bunch of do's. And we get to do, and they're fun to do, and they're life-giving. And so he made a big point of saying, this is what the commandment is prohibiting, but instead these are the things we get to do out of our life in Christ. So I'm going to lump these two together because if I were the one writing these instructions, I would have done that, but nobody asked me. So 9 and 10 are really all about coveting anything that is your neighbor's, any person that is your neighbor's, and anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, here's how this works. When you and I, anyone, begins to intensely want what is our neighbor's, it becomes dangerous, even if you don't think so. It's a slippery slope. Uh, it's like a long slide down into darkness and hurt for other people. Because if you begin to intensely desire things beyond wishing and wondering, you're into coveting. And it's a real thing. It's not an old instruction for old time and nobody does it anymore. Luther said we all do it. In fact, he said we all break all ten commandments and we must return to Christ and his forgiveness and his strength and his love. Um, because coveting takes over your life. It's a rabbit hole. Uh, you might even get over the fact at some time that you wanted something of your neighbors, but you start to feel jealous and resentful. And it becomes very complex, and pretty soon your life is wrapped up in coveting something that is your neighbors. All right, good way to remember this. I didn't make it up, but I love it. Uh, these commandments, and I like to call it instruction or the sayings, because they're not called commandments in the Bible. Our Hebrew friends from way back talked about these ten as instruction, as God's gift to the world, to talk about a right way to live that brings goodness and love and an evil way to live that brings destruction. It's instruction for us so that we don't end up in destruction. Okay, love people and use things. Okay, that's really what the commandments, this instruction is about. Not the other way around. Not love things and use people. But that's what coveting does. 
The problem with coveting, which is so prevalent, is that you end up treating your neighbor not as a human being, child of God, made in the image of God, but you treat your neighbor as an object. And that's where all the trouble begins. And it just gets worse. We are not objects. We are beautiful people, all people in the world. God loves them all. And they're not objects. We're human beings created in God's image. Coveting overlooks that. Okay, so a little story, because I think stories are the best way to remember things. In one of my congregations, in a town of about 14,000, so it wasn't huge, there were two families who belonged to First Lutheran Church who really liked each other. Uh, they knew each other since uh, they had each gotten married. One lived on this side of the block, one lived on the other side of the block. Same block. They both were members of the parish. They had kids that were uh, either a year off in school, or one, uh, two of them were in the same grade. They'd been in confirmation together. They worshiped together. They liked going on picnics together. They did all kinds of stuff together. They went on boundary water canoe trips with me. We had a lot of fun. We talked about faith. They were great people, and they really liked each other. But... One family had inherited a lot of money and a beautiful house on that block, probably four times the size of the other family. And it didn't seem to make any difference at first. But then time went on, see? And the family with a lesser house and less toys, I mean, the first family not only had these big rooms and dens and a little library in there and a big garage to hold both boats and the SUV and the snowmobiles and the jet skis. You know, really, they had money. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't an issue at first. But as those kids grew older, they began to peer over more often to the other house and noticed all the toys coming out of that big garage, and while they were invited very often to go with that family, they began to have a slow jealousy jag burn. And it continued. And that's the way coveting works. You don't even want it to work that way, but it has a mind of its own. And it pulls you down, see? And uh, after a while, this uh, jealousy turned into true covetousness which then takes over your mind, your thoughts, your daydreaming, your wishes, your wants. And soon the relationship begins to crumble with the family whose possessions you are coveting. And that's exactly what happened. Soon they weren't at church anymore. Well, they, they, they made sure they were at the other service. You know, the 9 and 11. And they knew which one this family went to and this one went to. And they stopped and uh, conversations around the house became more and more jaded and cynical. Uh, Mom noticed it first, and I love what she did. Um, she noticed that her kids were not having those kids over as often, and vice versa. She noticed that in the house there was a kind of grayness that got grayer than Tacoma and Gig Harbor. It got to be dark. Comments were made. Jabs were made. At first they were funny, but then they weren't funny because they weren't enjoying each other and the house was devoid of joy completely. And one night she said, and I loved how she did it, she said, listen up everyone, something is really bad. It's, it's gone too far. And I will be the first, she said, to say, I am guilty of it. So hear me out. I love this mother. She said, I've been coveting what this family has. And so have you. So have you, Dad, her husband. <laughs> We've all done it. And it's got to stop. We know better. We know the catechism. We know the scriptures. We're not even going to church anymore. What has happened? It's got to stop. About that time, unfortunately, there was a tragic fire in the rich family's house. 
Um, actually, it did more damage to the garage, which it almost obliterated, and a gazebo that was between the garage and the south side of the house. But it did damage on that side too. And I don't know how this works, but the insurance company didn't cover all of it. And now dad took a leadership role. I mean, mom started it. <laughs> um, he was cut to the quick. They all were. And he went over there. He was electric. Uh, he was electrician for the mill. Top electrician. And he went over there with one of his kids. And he said, we got some work to do. Knocked on the door. They hadn't talked for a long time. He said, <clears throat> I want to tell you that I am willing. I heard the insurance doesn't cover it all. I would like to put all electrical outlets in your house and in your garage, what's left of it. And furthermore, our family would like to come and rebuild your gazebo together so that we can have that partnership and that joy and that fun that we used to have. And you know what happened? They got their neighbors back. Not only that, they got their joy back. They got their uh, everyday sustenance of love back. The kids started to be nicer to each other. Mom and dad kissed more often. I mean, this is what happens when the Christ who lives in us overcomes the breaking of these commandments or the misuse of the, or just leaving the commandments out of our lives. Because basically the instruction given to Moses that Moses passes on to the Hebrews is that you want to live a life that is the dream of God, here's the instruction. If you want to leave it behind, just be warned, it's not going to be nice. It doesn't mean God hates you because of it. We don't have to go there. And especially as Christians, as Luther said, when that happens, that's when you turn to Christ and you get embraced by Christ and he says, my child, let me give you the power to overcome it. And that's exactly what happened in that family. Um, now, the, Kim and I, Pastor Kim and I, wanted to make sure you knew that these commandments, uh, and eight of them are uh, you shall not, two of them are you shalls, but Luther said, I'm going to make them all you shall do. That's why he wrote his explanation for it. But all of them take their framework from the very first commandment, which Pastor Kim gets to talk about. I'm doing the first two Wednesdays, and he's doing the last three. There's five Wednesdays. But all of them are framed by the very first commandment, which is both command and promise. And it starts with a promise. You know how it goes. I am the Lord your God. Period. The decision has already been made. <laughs> for you, the person sitting next to you, for me, for everyone in the world, though they all know it. God is their God, and God loves us. And so God, through this instruction, is teaching us, you want to live a beautiful life, a loving life? Here's the instruction. Screw it up, and, you know, it's not going to be nice. But every one of the commandments takes its form from the very first one. We live a certain way because God is our God, and when we screw up, we're forgiven. So I'm, I'm just bringing those two together in one commandment. But I want to leave you with a blessing and a reminder that while we are imperfect with these, the perfect one covers us and renews us and more than that, grants us through the Holy Spirit the ability to do the right thing, the good thing, the healthy thing in any of the Ten Commandments. So, um, you know, I make the sign of the cross quite often. And I do that to remind myself of the first command, which is a promise. God is my God. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a reminder I belong to God in Christ. But I also like to teach this, especially for the confirmands, is that you can think of the cross in a couple of different ways. One is to make the sign of the cross to remember whose life you're connected to and who forgives you constantly. But secondly, to remember that, like even in these commandments, you know, Jesus summarized them all by saying, uh, all of the commandments, in fact, he said, all of the scriptures and all the commandments are summarized in one that has two parts. Love God and love your neighbor. And if you think in the old, and it's a metaphor, 
in this case. If you think of God up there, and we if you kind of come away from thinking that in scientific times, which is good, but if you think of that old-fashioned way, my life is under the guidance and love of God, and I am called to use that love to my neighbors. So I sometimes tell the confirmants, God be in my head, God be in my heart, and God be in my neighbors through me, which is, I think, a helpful way of thinking about why we make the sign of the cross. To be reminded, we have a joyful to-do part about every commandment. Uh, now let's read those, those two together again as a closing. Uh, and just the part, what does this mean? And you may emphasize the two words, but instead, if you like. Commandment number 10, uh, just the, what does this mean? Together, we are to respect and love God so that we do not entice, force, or steal away from our neighbors, their spouses, household workers, or livestock, but instead urge them to stay and fulfill their responsibilities to our neighbors. Number nine, what does this mean? We are to respect and love God so that we do not try to trick our neighbors out of their inheritance or property, or try to get it for ourselves by claiming to have a right to it and the like, but instead be of help and service to them in keeping what is theirs. God be in my mind, God be in my heart, and through me, God be in all of my neighbors. Amen.